know we already talked like a lot about like graphs and like graph databases themselves. So I kind of want to not follow that path directly, but I want to talk about like how we can deploy them. And maybe just question up front, who has heard about Mesos or who has even used Mesos or DCOS before? Wow, that's actually, that's a lot of people. Who has used Neo4j on Mesos or DCOS? One hand. I hope one hand, yeah, at least. Okay, so uh, that's what we're going to talk about here. And uh, to start out, I'm Jörg. So I'm working uh, as a distributed systems engineer and uh, developer advocate at Mesosphere. So that means I'm mostly coding on here, my shirt, Hachi Mesos, or I'm like around giving talks, developing demos, talking to those guys as, for example, Neo4j, to get like more partners involved in this ecosystem. And so this is actually also how we got this idea for this talk. And first question, we actually need a cluster. So Neo4j also runs kind of decent on like one box. We can already do quite a lot, quite large graphs in like a single box. And so the cool thing about Neo4j is actually that we can uh, cluster for both like high availability, but also for like those uh, replica servers where we have read replicas for specific use cases. So those of you who might not have seen that yet, so Neo4j it has like a core uh, clusters, core servers, and they're actually uh, in the current version they have like synced writes. So uh, they're like also read write uh, here, and they're going to have one elected leader who is kind of like the server in charge and then around we can actually we can create a bunch of read replicas which are only there to basically read data and the cool part about is I can have dedicated read replicas for specific like purposes or topics so they'll be optimized for for example for reporting and another uh, analytics uh, I can have other read replicas uh, targeted to specific uh, query types so I can actually, by utilizing multiple cluster nodes, I can really efficiently have uh, answer like all slash most of my queries uh, throughout my cluster. And so this is like one use case where we need a cluster. And then of course the question, how can we actually manage this kind of like large scale cluster? Um, when we as Mesosphere, when we look at clusters, what we often see is kind of like a static uh, partitioning across different workloads. Imagine, uh, so what we would, for example, see, we would see like uh, four servers being dedicated to Neo4j. And this doesn't necessarily mean four physical servers. This can mean like four virtual servers or, yeah, four instances basically reserved for Neo4j. Then we have another subpart of our cluster, which is dedicated to Kafka. We have one subpart of our cluster, which is maybe dedicated to like a second Neo4j cluster. So uh, this might, for example, be the test cluster, uh, which some other team is running. Uh, we might have a bunch of microservices. We might have uh, something as we heard about before. We might have Apache Flink running there. So we actually, what we end up doing is we end up subpartitioning our cluster into like very a number of smaller subclusters, each dedicated to a specific like service or a specific uh, framework. And this actually has multiple disadvantages. The first one from an operational standpoint is uh, that I actually, as an operator, I really have to take care a lot about like moving stuff. So for example, what happens if one of those Neo4j nodes, in, like my main Neo4j cluster is failing? Then I, as an operator, I would have to go in, move over one node uh, from, for example, from the Flink cluster. Uh, and so it would actually involve like a lot of manual work. The second big disadvantage of this model is that we actually end up with very bad resource utilization. So usually those clusters, they end up at resource utilization somewhere between 50 and 20% because each of those subclusters, so my Neo4j subcluster, my Flink subcluster, I have to basically provision them for like the highest load around. And so I'm actually doing normal operations. I'm wasting a lot of resources. So the target image where we would actually like to go to is uh, this here, where we actually, we kind of 
We don't care about so much individual machines. We basically we treat our data centers like one big box, one big pool of resources, and there we simply deploy all those services. And uh, I, as an operator, I don't care too much on which particular node, for example, Neo4j is running. As long as my cluster is up and running and healthy, uh, the system should take care of this. And this is this picture is exactly the reason why Apache Mesos uh, was originally developed. Uh, we're going to see a bit about the history in just a second, but basically this ease of operational use. So how can I deploy like my large compute cluster? How can I deploy uh, near multiple Neo4j instances? Uh, this was like one of the main reasons. And second reason is basically increasing resource utilization uh, throughout my cluster. And if we just briefly go back to this image, like one of the main drivers, in my opinion, why we see the increasing need for such kind of system uh, as Mesos is that actually here is the number of frameworks, the number of systems which actually would like to own, which would like to have their own subcluster, is increasing. Like nowadays we have Spark, Flink, and Neo4j, so there are like a lot of frameworks, there are a lot of subclusters I could potentially create, and so it becomes very like unfeasible. Back in those days when we just had like Hadoop there, one system which wanted to own the entire cluster, that was still like kind of okay-ish, uh, but now we have like a lot of different systems wanting to own a cluster, it's not as okay anymore. And the way Mesos is actually doing that is by this fancy term called two-level scheduling. And two-level scheduling basically refers to that we have uh, Mesos on the one hand basically just dealing with resource allocation and then for particular frameworks, so basically for each of those frameworks we saw on the left side, we have a, a scheduler. So the scheduler is basically like this component which is controlling which resources are used in the cluster, uh, how do I react to when one of those nodes is failing. And actually, there's even a default scheduler. So for example, for the near for day example, uh, we will see in a second, we didn't have to write a scheduler, but uh, there's like a default scheduler I can simply use, which will take care of that scheduling my stuff, restarting stuff if it failed in the cluster. And this is actually done, uh, and this is like symbolizing this two level uh, scheduling as well, because here in the middle, this is basically like the Mesos layer. This is the Mesos abstraction layer, which is abstracting the schedulers, which here I have like the Marathon scheduler. Marathon is the default scheduler I was talking about. And then this, for example, could be a dedicated Neo4j scheduler. This could be a Spark scheduler. And so they are basically separated by this layer of Mesos, by the Mesos masters from the underlying node, from the underlying hardware. So actually those schedulers there, they don't see the entire infrastructure. They basically only see the subset which is provided by the Mesos master. And that makes it actually uh, very flexible and independent to failure. So if uh, one of those nodes fails, basically the scheduler can restart it on another node and the application can continue running. Uh, also, just uh, to have the complete picture, also this master level, the Mesos master level is highly uh, available. We have a Zookeeper quorum, which basically always makes sure that we always select like the leading master, similar to like this, uh, yeah, so we have basically multiple standby uh, nodes uh, if one of the masters should fail. The history is actually, it's also kind of interesting. So it actually originated as a class project at UC Berkeley. And that's actually the same lab where Spark was initially invented or uh, developed. And Spark was originally actually developed as like a demo framework to show how easy it is to write distributed systems together with uh, Mesos. And then what actually happened, those students who were developing that at UC Berkeley Amplab, they actually gave a tech talk at Twitter. And Twitter, if you remember, had like all those issues like this fail fail whenever the infrastructure couldn't cope with all the users. And so they actually uh, were really happy about it. And they, uh, which in my opinion was a really cool decision, they also decided to actually uh, make it an Apache uh, open source project pretty soon. And so uh, in 2010, it became an Apache incubator project. And I believe about nine months later, it was like a full top level Apache project. And then the last step on this slide is basically DCUS. DCUS, uh, as we're going to see, is another open source 
distribution of mesos which basically brings uh, like all the stuff around which makes it easy to deploy and which makes it easy for like uh, other frameworks as for example neo4j to integrate there uh, so uh, I mentioned almost all of this maybe just uh, those uh, for reference like who's actually all using that Twitter is heavily based on it, Airbnb, whoever booked his Airbnb while staying here in Brussels has seen that, PayPal, Netflix, and actually anyone who ever used uh, uh, Apple Siri also has used Mesos underneath. So when we're talking about databases, of course we also have to talk about storage. And there are different kind of applications or different kind of data applications and all of them they have different needs for storage so the really easy part this is basically uh, on the top this is like those front-end or non-persistent applications if I have my Node.js application which doesn't have any state if I have my Nginx which doesn't really have uh, a whole lot of state or none uh, then I don't really care on which of those nodes is restarting imagine my Nginx server is failing I don't care where it's restarting, it can be any node as soon as it's coming back up quickly. Um, if I'm having a database, as for example uh, Neo4j, it's, it's slightly different, right? Because there I actually have state, and there I actually end up with two, two different kinds of models. So there are databases as Neo4j, which are really written for this kind of like distributed ecosystem already. So what they have is what we saw like on this second slide, they have like inbuilt replication, so they can actually survive a single node failure or potentially multiple depending on how many replicas you have. Um, but there are all the other databases, so if I take like a, a standard uh, MySQL instance, like a single MySQL instance, this won't survive like a single node failure, but then basically all my data is going to be gone. So for actually both those models, uh, we have different storage opportunities inside Mesos. So for the models, as for example Neo4j, which already have this inbuilt replicas, we have something called local persistent volume. This means you're going to get fast storage, which is directly attached to the node. It's just going to be the hard disk flash drive SD inside the node. And uh, I can really use that quickly and uh, fast as I would use a normal, uh, normal disk. And the nice thing is whatever happens in the cluster, when that node fails, when Neo4j, the instance is failing, whenever it comes back up, I still get all those resources back so I can keep on running on that particular node. If I'm on the other side and I'm running something like this old-fashioned MySQL, uh, then it's slightly different because in that case I cannot survive a single node failure and I actually uh, I want to make sure uh, that I uh, can restart up on any node in the cluster because if that node is failing I need to be able to retrieve my nodes and that's where we actually have external storage uh, which helps us to be able to restart on any node and basically retrieve that distributed storage. If I have something like Neo4j I don't want to use the distributed storage because in that case I would have distributed I.O. on like two levels. First inside Neo4j the database for each replica and then again on like the storage layer. So if I already have the layer inbuilt, I don't want to use it. DCOS, so as mentioned before, DCOS is basically distribution around Mesos, so it basically comes with like all the features, service discovery, load balancing, comes with a nice UI which we're going to see, so it actually it, it helps me to deploy it because I don't have to worry about like all those nifty details, it basically it comes all out of the box, I can install it on-prem, there are packages available, I can install it with cloud templates, so I can actually also choose where I want to run it. This is UI, which we're going to see in a second. And maybe just more important as we're talking about uh, diff uh, particular applications, we have this cool thing called uh, apps. We have basically the app store for your cluster. So here you can go with like one click, you can install Spark, Kafka, or actually also our different Neo4j packages. And as I have some minutes left, I would actually just like to go to my cluster and show that. So here I have my cluster running, so that's basically it's running on a cluster in Amazon and as we can see uh, my components are healthy and what I actually did already, of course it takes some time, 
I installed the Neo4j core service. If we go to this Universe App Store, we actually we have uh, multiple packages available. So Neo4j, how readable is that? With the Beamer, kind of okay? Okay, so actually in this App Store, we have uh, three different packages available. So uh, the first one, it's the core package. And what that'll do, and what I already done, it's basically gonna go and install Neo4j inside my cluster. So inside my cluster means that a typical DCOS cluster, it has internal nodes which are not exposed to the outside for security reasons. And then there are uh, external nodes. So the typical pattern, which we're also going to do here, is basically on those publicly available nodes, we're going to install a proxy, uh, a load balancer, and that's I'm basically going to proxy into my cluster to my particular application. And that's something which I can do right now. So I'll go here and install my Neo4j proxy. Cool, it's been installed. If we go back to the dashboard, we actually see is here uh, my CPU allocation is slightly increasing. Also, slightly my memory allocation, it doesn't take too much memory. And I actually now also have four, four tasks running. So uh, it's going up. If I go in here, I actually see I have now my core and my proxy running. And let's hope that it's really running and available. So this is a public node. And yes, here we go. Let me just double check that I'm not using Bolt. Yes, because uh, we are dealing uh, with Amazon and like internal IPs. Uh, I unfortunately cannot use Bolt from the public, uh, from the uh, proxy, but that's all configured nicely. And let's have a look at our cluster. So, what, what I can see here, I now have three nodes available in my cluster. So I have this one leaf here and I have the followers. And what we actually can also do in a second, we can try to kill one of them and just see that it stays up. But what I want to do first, I want to go back to the universe and install like the third package we saw before, which is the read replica. So we are installing those read replicas. Let's look again on the dashboard. Yes, this takes more CPU and uh, memory, so it's starting up. And currently it's still unhealthy. And uh, if we take a look here, we can actually follow what's happening. So they're actually running, but they have health checks defined. And those health checks, they're like an important measure because they actually, they tell multiple components within the system uh, which parts can be used and which not. So for example, if one of them is unhealthy for a number of time, this is a signal to the system, hmm, maybe I should restart it because it didn't really work as expected. So in that case, uh, the system would go and actually restart this one instance, which is not healthy in this case. Uh, also load balancers. So for example, if I have a load balancer up front, it would of, and it's smart, <laughs> smart load balancer, it would only use uh, those uh, instances as backend which are currently healthy and hands only go to the healthy ones. So if we go here and we reload, we actually now see here we have two re replicas. Cool. Actually, but now we need even more. So now I can actually just go here and let's scale them up. So I can actually do all of this, what I'm doing here, the UI. I can also do all of this wire API endpoints, wire REST API. I can do all of this also from a CLI. And now we're just, just deploying like our uh, cert read replica. Currently it's stating. Hope I have enough resource left. Yeah, and now it's running and hopefully it's also gonna be healthy in just a second. This is what it's still waiting for. And once that's done, we also are uh, gonna see it in the near for j tab. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's reload here. Yep, there is our shared read replica. Uh, 
Now let's actually just go here and kill one of them. So kills, it could either be uh, some error happened, my application uh, was killed because it was using too much memory, it was, uh, there was a programming error inside and it's just crashing, and so uh, my one instance is gone. Kill. And we actually didn't really, uh, that was so fast, because so we didn't really see too much, but what we can actually see here, updated a second ago, so as soon as one of those instances dies, the system is going to recognize, and the system basically tries to keep this invariant, uh, that there are always three instances running, and so it's going to go there and actually uh, restart one of them. Wait. Yeah. And there it's restarting. Cool, uh, but this kind of isn't too cool yet. So what we actually we want to do is we want to run some stuff on it. And I hope this is yeah, healthy, good. Um, and so what, what I prepared here, as mentioned before, uh, we have also CLI support. And I just gonna show you a short app definition. This app definition uh, is basically how the system can be told to start something. And so this is actually using uh, the Neo4j Twitter load. So it's a load generator, like artificially generating Twitter data. And so I'm going to post that to the cluster in just a second. Just one nice bit I wanted to point out is actually how we can address those servers within the cluster, right? If I'm writing such kind of app definition, I don't know where it's running in the cluster, and I don't want to hard code that in my app definition. So what I actually do, I can use a service discovery uh, uh, names. So in this case, it's actually it's a virtual IP, a named virtual IP. And no matter where that's running in the cluster, I can always reach it under this address. So in case this is actually also a load balance address, so if I have multiple backends, this address is going to load balance uh, to anywhere in my cluster. And this is like quite useful because I can just hard code that from within my application and I don't have to particularly care where the other application is running in the cluster. So. App as. And I actually I could have done the same now from, from the UI. I could have just copied it here. I could have done the same posting it to an uh, endpoint. And now we actually see it's all staging. This usually means it's holding the Docker container. In production use cases, you would have like all your Docker images in a private registry within your cluster. For this demo purposes, I'm using the normal Docker hub. So actually the Docker pulls, they take a while. But uh, seems to be deploying. Seems hopefully to be deploying. Staging. Uh, demo gods are not nice to me. Yeah. Let's see what, what's happening inside Neo, whether data is actually pushed in. No, I'm not seeing my notes yet. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, but uh, it's, it's failing containers. So let's do live debugging and figure out what's wrong. So I can now actually just go here and check the standard error. No write operations are allowed uh, directly on this database. So he's not finding the leader for one. Hmm? Yeah, I hope. Oh, I yeah. see, I see, I see one leader. Okay, so I, I'm going to use debug this after this talk, but basically uh, 
what we would see is basically uh, this, so it's app definition, say a really, really easy way to deploy applications talking to Neo4j if they would find the leading master right now, which uh, I'll just figure out after the talk uh, what's wrong there, why it's not deploying. But this is why we actually see this keeps on restarting and uh, failing because it can't talk to the master. Nice part is what we could see that it actually, it's kind of easy to figure out because we have an easy way to get to the logs. I don't have to figure out now uh, here and we can actually see uh, it's running on different servers. So I can actually, uh, don't have to worry about like on which servers instance is running now. I can simply go there and figure out what's wrong here. Uh, why isn't that running? Okay, that would actually bring me back to almost my last slide. Um, and yeah, this would have been the demo. We would load like our Twitter data and actually see that it's running the cluster. What we uh, then can actually do, we can uh, create uh, different read replicas for that and uh, basically scale up and scale down the cluster as, as we did before. And uh, yeah, this actually brings me to my last slide. Whoever wants to try that out, the code is available online. Feel free to play with that. Uh, and the packages are also available whenever you install DCUS anywhere. So. Uh, feel free to play with that. And actually, as it's open source, feel free to contribute uh, and uh, give us feedback what we can improve there. Okay, cool. hmm? Thanks. Questions for you? Hmm? Okay. Well, I'm, sure, I'm sure questions. One is uh, since 3.1, you have two types of uh, clustering. Um, is there a reason why you only present one of them? What do you mean one? Um, you have to oh. Call the clustering and the, uh, available. So uh, we, we actually we, we have both running. So no, it's, huh? it's only call yeah. clusters because the setup of course the mm. cluster and all the oh. self discovery of a course mm. cluster and SWAT routing and so on is only call mm. the clustering and going forward H A will go away and uh, and so on. Okay, but oh. That, okay. <laughs> yeah. I see different roles on the scenario. Oh, uh, you you mean? Followers setting? No, followers no. is uh, hmm. replicas, hmm. and it was just the output of the UI. Okay. It's basically you that, yeah. you can name it uh, as you like. Are replicas hmm. and leaders. Hmm. Oh no. Core servers can have two roles. Core servers can be the leader or followers of the core. In general, if you mm -hmm. see that, it should be one. The one of them is the leader in the core, and the other ones are followers. So here, it's an automatic setting. Mm -hmm. So they fail over to. Uh, right. So the leader mm -hmm. coordinate the the uh, raft, the uh, commit, and the plus uh, mem membership. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, with the performance diagnosis, like uh, I don't know, with the performance problem, uh, like swapping or something like that. So, uh, you mean uh, in particular of Neo4j or in general of uh, like the overall system? Okay. Neo4j would actually forward to you if that's okay. And uh, for uh, DCS, we actually have metric endpoints. So, basically, and this is also where uh, something like uh, the application would integrate so that basically uh, if you output your metrics on like a DSTATS endpoint system is going to pick it up basically aggregate that uh, and you can actually see this is belonging to Neo4j this is belonging to uh, that particular cluster and uh, so basically uh, see all those performance statistics uh, together. Uh, on like both system level. So for example, what, what we saw there is like the allocation. So I'm saying I want to give uh, my Neo4j read replica it should at most have like two gigabytes of RAM. And so one thing which you should always monitor is like how much is it actually using? It's always using like 1.99 and you're really close to being killed or are you actually using much less uh, than your wasted resources in your cluster? <coughs> And yeah, for Neo4j, uh, mm. that means that we still have mm. to, to mm. add um, to the package or to, to, mm. to Neo is uh, to, to support like this is the output and then uh, for Neo4j has built-in metrics quite a lot. Mm. You just have to build the connector that writes it so that uh, makes sense and over the display. Uh, display. Yeah. Uh, oh.
I'm not, not sure who was first, but yeah. Uh, what happens when a leader dies? Yeah, because you don't see the data, right? So is it like a replica began a, a, a leader, but when the leader comes up, so going the Docker, you load the data, so is there some balancing automatic done? Or? So you mean if one of the core servers yeah. is dying? So if one of those core servers is dying, one of the others would take over? Uh, and the system first keeps on running, but you mean how is the data recovered? Yes. Or, okay. So basically this one is gone, what's going to happen? So uh, what's going to happen uh, kind of depends on how uh, you have different configuration knobs. By default what's going to happen is he will try to put it back on that server. And then you can also specify like after a while he should stop that and uh, go somewhere else. So basically you can define this behavior uh, this failover behavior, what should happen. But in, as, as we're talking about distributed systems, uh, uh, often what's happening is actually is that you have like a short network partitioning uh, between some servers, right? Because your network is so reliable. Uh, and so uh, usually you want to wait for either of that server to rejoin completely, or if it's just like a task failure, if just the uh, core server task has failed, you want to wait uh, until it's restarted, which we'll also see what would happen. And in that case, as being restarted on the same node, uh, by default, he's going to pick up his data again. Yeah. Hmm? And for hmm. Neo itself, uh, if you start a new node out of the cluster, hmm. a new instance hmm. in the cluster on a on a blank machine, and it just gets the data from the other uh, hmm. machines of the cluster and then continues to work. Hmm. Last question: hmm. How oh. are you doing uh, for balancing in this OS? Using or something else. Um, the, so it uh, depends on the method uh, you're using, right? So uh, what what we saw with the virtual IPs, um, you can you can configure that uh, if you know like a certain endpoints, it's quite hidden. Uh, but you can select your method, and for the other load balancing for which we call like external load balancing, which basically is an HA proxy, uh, you can also uh, configure your HA proxy uh, load balancing method. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we use uh, replica and for uh, <coughs> an um, internet connection is on, can I continue to input data and synchronize later? You mean with the read replica? Mm -hmm. So, so you that because you mm, just read only mm, like a hash instance. Mm, so it, yeah. uh, you can have a large number of these, but they're not, you can't write to read replica. So you can write to uh, nodes in the, in the core, but only uh, if you have a write quorum. Otherwise, you have to buffer the, the input uh, in, a, in a queue or something like that. Yes, but so. is, 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 uh, do you have a solution for that? Because uh, on, the, on the replica, I need to, to be 24 hours up. Anyhow, so even if no, uh, the, the, the replica mm. itself, it, it, mm. it replica is just a throwaway instance, so it doesn't have to be up, so it can be killed and then there'll be new mm. replica. Because the replica doesn't really have an identity or something like that, it's mm. just a machine of the cluster that provides data. So you can't really say, I want this instance to be up, uh, because it will just restart instances as, as it needs to. And uh, mm. what I could imagine what you could do is on the, on the like load balancer mm. level, if the server is in a, for instance, partition split mode where there's no write majority, then you queue up, for instance, requests in the, in the load balancer until the, um, the core has healed the partition and then it will continue to write back the um, so so But the, that's a good point. Mm. So we will make sense to provide some like documentation on how to set mm. some something like that up so that you can have an application that sends events to the cluster and then it can replay recover events after mm. the partition has healed. Again. Yeah. So that's a good, good that's actually. Just in, in general, that problem of any distributed and system, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Thank well, you very much. Thank you, everyone.